I, I basically, you know, and I get so much flack from engineers about this who, who want to believe in it, and I just go right back at them and say, I want to see your resume, show me your dissertation, I want to see what, show me the empirical stuff, throw out the ideology, I respect your work, I don't care about your ideology. And um, I'll tell you, I mean, this is not a scientific survey, but I mean, wow, I'll tell you, the difference in productivity between ideological versus non-ideological engineers on this point is night and day. You really see the effectiveness and the real advances coming from the people who, who aren't ideological. Yeah. Let's see what questions we have out here in the audience from the, uh, right here. Oh, here comes the mic. <laughs> You're the guy who worked on a game, right? Hi. <laughs> yeah. I will first wanted to say hello because you and I worked together briefly about Where? 20 years ago uh -huh. when you were doing virtual heads up stuff, virtual reality stuff. Uh -huh. Where were so, you? Um, I was just a uh, wet behind the ears contractor floating engineer. Oh, did you work at VPL or something? No, I worked with you for like a couple of weeks on some project. Some project. Okay, cool. Yeah. But he wasn't, he wasn't ideological. No, now okay. I am. Uh, uh, I, I was a software engineer f almost for the last 25 years. Now I'm an artist. But um, what I uh, was itching to talk about with you, because I've been thinking it for a while, is that there, I believe it was a, uh, a neuropsychologist at Rutgers who wrote this small article in the Times oh, uh, it was a while ago that, that noticed that the People, the relationship and the behavior that people have with their little PDAs and the mm -hmm. constant taking them out is a form of acquired attention deficit disorder, um, which is a really interesting thing. Is mm -hmm. that and what his premise was that it actually the way we interact with machines has an actual ability that will rewire the brain, yeah, yeah. so that people's behavior actually changed. Um, Bill, I think Bill Keller just last week wrote this article in New York Times Magazine where he started a tirade by posting on Twitter, um, does Twitter make us stupid? And of course, that, that turned into a huge, huge thing. Mm -hmm. But what he was using as an example, and I think it was him, was that the more we have access to this instant information, the more we outsource our intelligence. We yeah. don't, act, you know, we no, outsource yeah. it so that we actually have to know less. And he used the Gutenberg press as a as an absurd example. I mean, a, that we don't need to memorize things anymore. Um, have you, have you, um, what are your yeah, thoughts you think on this? Uh, on this Twitter AD, makes you stupid. Well, or something? no, ADD, like the acquire, like okay. rewiring yeah, um, the brain. So let me let me make a couple of comments. First of all, um, I write for the New York Times once in a while, and. The New York Times is worse than Twitter because the thing about Twitter is that at least it's up to you to decide what to subscribe to and all that. Like you're at least Twitter is fairly transparent about what's going on. I have my problems with Twitter, but it's it's you know, I mean the New York Times is doing this thing now where when two different people sign on to it, they don't see the same front page. And uh, also there's this thing where the top articles that get for, for, by their own estimation, are the ones that are hitting show up in multiple categories. You seem to see the same thing over and over again, you know, which becomes like so deadening. Like there'll be some like uh, Twitter makes you stupid, and then it'll show up both in technology and arts and politics, and like and so they're using up their screen real estate for this thing. Like they're making, they're doing a really bad job of it. And um, when you write for them, uh, you're kind of under pressure to rise in the ranks of the the various social media measurements, and so. Um, they've been very nice about letting me speak my mind, which I which I do. If you look at my stuff in the Times, but I think the I think the thing is kind of sinking under the weight of exactly this stuff. So it was just bizarre to me that Keller is like pouncing on Twitter when their own stuff is actually worse, especially later, late lately. You know, I mean, I'm just so it's just so strange to me. I don't know. And then on the question of um, what um, changing cognitive style through technology, yeah, um, it's overwhelming. I. Um, in, in the, I actually started my book with uh, some of the stories of my collaborations with a guy named Jeremy Bialenson, who's a scientist at Stanford. And uh, what he does, what we've worked on together, is putting people in virtual reality and then just tweaking the situation to change their cognitive style. And, and some of the stuff is so simple that you, would, you wouldn't believe it would create an effect, but it does. So for instance, 
if you change the height of somebody's avatar in an immersive virtual social simulation, you can predictably change the outcome of their, of their sort of influence and power and interactions and how well they'll do at a virtual job interview and all kinds of things. Like just, just like an inch or two. I mean, it's just the craziest thing. And you can change their race and their gender and you get like these predictable changes. And it's, it's so depressing and it's so awful and you just sort of feel embarrassed to be human at the end of it but then if you, the the real the real action happens when you start playing around with things like this like how repetitive the information is and and how and whether you, you get people into this sort of uh, addictive cycle of needing more and more and yeah you, you can totally recreate all sorts of things that we might diagnose as as a cognitive disabilities by a user interface and i think it happens all the time and unfortunately there's a bit of a commercial incentive if you can get somebody compulsively stuck in a cycle, you know. I mean, that's that's gold if you're if you're thinking in terms of selling influence or what's what's called advertising, but that's an outmoded word at this point. It's just access and influence. Could you talk a little bit about um, alternatives? Like, okay, that's happening. Oh so yeah, yeah. Therefore, yeah. we should. Sure, sure. Yeah, Th there are alternatives that are um, a little harder to articulate at the moment because the ideology is so thick. So. Um, I think I've tried to talk about the alternative I, I, I bring up with engineers, which is genuine empiricism, uh, absent right, ideological right. interpretation, because that just does wonders, you know. And so I've mentioned a few examples, uh, but that can go much, much further. Um, and I think that an engineering culture focused on articulatable, non-ideological criteria that are measurable would automatically become humanistic and compassionate. Um, I really do. I, 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 and uh, I hope I've been able to make the argument for that. Um, I, there's another level of alternative, which is a whole big discussion, which I, I got into a little bit in, in the gadget book, and I'm, I'm working on a bit more for another book, which is this, the, the political and economic side of things. So right. um, the, um, the big problem with the internet was always that it could turn into the ultimate sort of spying and manipulation tool. And that was foreseen forever. I mean, people were talking about that from the very beginning of computing. Um, and uh, the, the, the scenario was often that uh, the government would do it, but it just happens. I guess Americans don't believe in government, so we've outsourced our own self-manipulation to private industry. And we've, uh, we have Facebook instead. And um, uh, the thing is that, that's a that's a that's a sort of a hopeless future that doesn't really get us anywhere, and it, it ties in very much. Um, a lot of my friends at Google and Facebook and some of the other companies are very into the singularity and all this stuff, and and part of it is because you, there's this sort of uh, way of thinking about reality where it's all a big information system and the job is to optimize it or something, and then if you think that way, then just getting everybody on Facebook so it looks like a big efficient information system seems like a lot of progress. But of course, if you think about it any other way, it, it, it might not necessarily. And so, um, the the only way out, this gets into this really interesting question, which is furthering this, the, the ancient process of, of uh, thinking about politics and how to organize human affairs. Uh, you can, um, you have one option, which is hoping for a wise king, and that's the Apple option. Then you have another option of, of saying, we're gonna have a giant, sort of this idea that individuals don't matter and we'll have these sort of superhuman things that'll be run by a, um, some sort of communist party elite or something. And that's more or less Facebook. Or that's why I call that stuff digital Maoism. It has so much in common. Um, and that's a whole other topic to get into, of course. But the one that I think is kind of interesting, and this, this upsets some people on the left because it makes me sound like a libertarian, although it also upsets some libertarians because they think that being libertarian means being Facebook and not making money, you know, you know, except like right now, the, the, the current idea in, in Silicon Valley is that the amount of money you make is determined by how close you are to the most powerful server. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing pretty well because I'm pretty close to some of the big servers. And, and if you're right on top and you own a big server, then you have the most money and the most influence and everything. So your proximity to the most central computers becomes the equivalent of power structure. Um, that's a stupid way to run the future. I mean, like, who wants that? But that's the one we're building right now. That's currently the normative path we're on. So, um, the better one actually kind of looks like some sort of um, uh, cap a sort of capitalism that's genuinely open, and, and this this does get a little confusing. But what you want is a situation where each person can be their own store. You're not dependent on Apple or Amazon or right. something, and we have more and more ways for people to make a living through their hearts and their minds instead of less and less right, ways to right, do that. Right. 
as information becomes more and more important. Because if we don't do that, then people can no longer uh, invent themselves. They become dependent on institutions for support. And, and th this, is a, this is a long story, but, um, uh, and, and it should be pointed out that historically, the first idea for the internet was by somebody who wanted exactly this thing I'm talking about, which now sounds so alien and strange, and that person's name was Ted Nelson. Um, but at any rate, um, what, sh what we need, to, uh, huge topic, and I'm gonna try to compress it. Um, going back to the 19th century, um, there were, there were uh, enormous controversies about um, what advanced technology would mean for people's lives. And uh, there were um, a lot of concerns that while technology made us more comfortable, it would also make us obsolete effectively so that we could starve in a land of plenty or become peasants in a land of hypothetical um, abundance, that sort of thing. And that early concern is exactly what drove a lot of what have, what have become the pillars of modernity. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. Science fiction as a genre was born out of that d argument. Um, with H.G. Uh, Wells, for instance, plotting futures in which uh, the human race would diverge into two one that was close to the servers, you know, and, and, and one which wasn't, and the obsolete ones would sort of degrade in one way, and the, the, the beneficial, the ones that benefited from it would also become degraded in a different way, which I think was quite an insight. And then uh, Marxism, Marx was completely about this technological change question. I mean, he was a technology writer, and he came up with another idea, which is, uh, you know, if, as technology gets better, eventually, um, people do become obsolete, and in order for them not to be peasants in a world of hypothetical but unrealized abundance, there has to be some kind of other structure that, that gives them that, and that was, that's the birth of, 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 the, the, of leftist thinking as we understand it. And then um, uh, there was a sort of Rousseauian response to it all, which is the M. Forsters, the machine stops, as one example. Who's read The Machine Stops? Yay. If, all right, you're another, uh, another homework assignment for you is go read a short story written over a century ago by E.M. Forster, who wrote Room with a View and all that. It's called The Machine Stops, and it's the very best description of the internet and its problems that you'll ever read. It's very current. It predates computers. So what you see, I'm sorry. Yeah, and then, anyway, but um, go, the, 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 um, the outcome of the 19th century thing was a sort of a social contract between technologists and the rest of the world, which is every time we make somebody obsolete because a machine gets good, we'll create a new job that creates a role for people that's even more dignified, more safe, more pleasant, more cerebral, more emotional, or whatever. Um, so that our new jobs will get better and better. And that was continuing to happen, and that's more or less what saved the world from communism, in my opinion that social contract, and uh, Sergey broke it 10 years ago. I mean, Google said, nah, we'll just start making, we'll just, instead of having the stuff from people's heads and hearts be part of a new economy, that's all the stuff that should be free in order to drive an advertising economy that makes the people close to the advertising server really rich. And it's a, it's a total abrogation of the social contract that made the 20th century possible. And so um, we have to get back to that. And, 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 and getting back there's not gonna be easy, but that's, I, I think it's really the, the apparent path forward. Is it, would you, wouldn't, isn't that more akin to the life and work and practice of an artist? Right, well, um, let's say, let's imagine for a second that machines get a lot better. And so there's, um, uh, the cars can either drive themselves or at least can avoid hitting each other. And um, there's, there's something that can help cook food so you have really great fresh food and some little robot just brought it from the field so it's even fresher and better. Like it's actually Rousseauian at the same time it's high tech. Like right, you imagine, right. <laughs> you can imagine this thing and this whole thing could happen. You know, all these little technologies could come about. Uh, we need a new energy cycle to run it but I think, you know, we can probably come up with one. We're pretty bright around here. So let's say we, we sort that out and um, we don't destroy ourselves and all that. So, so but anyway, let's say we get there. Um, at the end of the day, uh, there aren't too many options for how things work for people. Either there's some sort of a, a, a Marx, neo -Marx and, uh, Marxist idea in place where since a lot of people are considered useless and not really contributing anymore, there's just some institution that supports them. The problem with that is that there's no such thing as an unbiased version of such institutions, even if they try to be. Like in, in Marx's own writings, his, his description of what happens after the revolution is kind of depressing. He describes this time when the machines get good enough that we can all lounge about and have leisure. But what he would do is set up a world filled with beautiful lawns so we could practice archery and read the classics. Right. <laughs> and the thing about that is like, what if you don't 
what if you right. aren't good at archery or what if you don't want to read the classics like you know it's a world where somebody else has to decide what's good for you so that one's crappy and then another another possibility is like the google facebook world where um there are a few the people close to the machines become like super right. empowered more and more so and everybody else is just kind of somehow there it actually starts to look like marx's world um the world that i like is one where what people do with their heads and hearts online, the information interactions they have with the world, sustain them and give them the clout, the power to invent themselves, to invent their own lives, to form, formulate their own affairs, their own associations. In other words, it's kind of like capitalism and a free market, but in an information space. And you can only get there if everybody has equal access to a single market instead of these ones owned by Apple or Amazon. And you can only get there if you're able to um, monetize or make valuable even without money in some way whatever you do online right, right, right. and you can only get there if what you do online can translate into rent and food not just right, in, right, not right, just right, into that's, reputation right. and you can only get there if it works for very large numbers of people not only a lucky a lucky few who get you know who have the good fortune to throw up in front of a camera for youtube or something right. and so um that is uh you know so that's that's the future that can work in general and so it's an it's so so but anyway um i i've that's a whole, I'm writing a book trying to visualize that world in some detail and uh, yeah. Okay, we're running out of time, sorry. No, we're not, we have plenty of time. There's a question over here. Yeah. You had a question here on the end. Oh, hi. Oh, oh. Sorry, there's one back here first, go ahead. Oh, hi Lanya, yeah, I'm, I'm a uh, biomedical engineer by practice and uh, I'm an engineer who spent lots of time writing codes, not just proposing theories. So I did some hands-on uh, stuff and I was a very less confused person till the day before yesterday. And um, yesterday I started reading your book. So, <laughs> okay, I have two questions to ask you. One, I was briefly involved in uh, computational research in systems biology. And there is always this theory that we are part of the system and we cannot analyze ourselves. And we have to be part of a meta system to, to, to understand this. So whatever efforts we put into understanding our system can never be uh, validated because we are part of the system. So, so, wh so wh what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about this? Is it, is it meaningless to even put, put, put efforts to understand ourselves? Because uh, well, you know, um, this is one of those, did everybody understand the question? This is one of those questions that solves itself if you get specific and a little hard headed. So. Um, what do you mean by solve? If what you mean is some sort of ideological or poetic vision, it was kind of hopeless to start with. Then just whatever pleases you is fine. It's not science. If what you mean is a solution to a problem you can articulate, I think you can solve something when you're inside the system. A great example of that is the theory of relativity, which doesn't have an outside observer and yet is functional. Um, I don't see any reason why that can't be done, but the reason relativity was possible is Einstein was able to talk about specific measurable ideas that could be verified by specific experiments. And, you know, uh, so even though he's inside the very system he's describing and there, there cannot be any outside observer, it still is science, it's still measurable, it's still very useful, and it still provided perhaps the most accurate results of any prediction ever. And uh, I, don't see, I don't see any fundamental contradiction in setting a system you're part of. The key, though, is to ask questions that can be asked. You know, like, I mean, like, that's the wrong question. The right question is, can I formulate an experiment that can be interpreted independent of ideology? And, and if you can, then you can do science, and you can do engineering. If you can't, then you're doing religion or something. Okay, let's try another question. Over here, go ahead. Please. Well, this guy's had his hand up, so. Okay, so uh, just before I, I talked, you challenged me about how I'm doing, I don't know, whatever, and then I no. challenged you back, so. This is about something else. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like, you, you probably dealt with this somewhere, like, you, you, but, okay, so you know the problem, of, the, the general problem of other minds, right? Sure. So, and um, you, you talked about um, interpretation as being this, this crucial thing that if, if, you're not, if you're not thinking about uh, the fact that interpretation is happening, um, you're, you're, you're probably not going to uh, um, 
be particularly careful about the, the whether or not the system you're designing has benefits because like you're the one guess, who has to say whether or not the benefits are happening. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we can be in epistemic positions where we, we, we can be not sure in advance whether or not some other part of the world is going to be containing itself some interpretation going on or not. Like you can say, well, I don't know if there's, if there's going to be a child next year or not. Um, it seems to me like with uh, singularity related technologies, or sorry, singularity capable seeming technologies, or mm -hmm. I, I, that's probably the wrong way of characterizing it, but um, we're in this position where we're not sure whether it's going to be possible to engineer artificially um, systems that are going to be capable of interpretation. And, and so, but if you're, if you're getting your norms from this idea of, an, of interpretation as to what's, as, as to you know, whether or not a system is valuable, um, but then you're uncertain as to whether or not in the future something will itself be capable of that interpretation, then um, this is a disorienting position to be in. Um, so mm -hmm. the question is, uh, so how do you analyze that kind of possibility? Well, I mean, I, I'm, um, if you listen to me carefully, you'll notice that I'm agnostic on absolutes like that. I mean, um, it's very possible that that auto outline thing and word is self-conscious or something. But what I'm trying to focus on is incrementally how to be a good engineer. Now, um, so so in a sense, I I... This might sound strange, but the way I get out of it is by absolutely not caring about it. Like these sort of absolute questions about where there might or might not be consciousness are, as we all know, unanswerable. But the thing is that engineering is doable and empathy has to be based on faith that those you empathize with are real. Uh, if you don't have that faith, I think the universe ceases to exist or something. I don't know. I mean, there is a certain kind of uh, with Santana's animal faith, whatever. I mean, there has there has to be uh, something there just to just to be able to do anything with others. Um, there is the problem of the absolutely solipsistic engineer, and this is not a hypothetical thought experiment creature. These exist, and they aren't very good. I mean, they just don't do very good work. So, um, I. Uh, I try to just stick with empirical, practical, pragmatic approaches about present day issues. And I just, I just think that actual achievement, making things that work, makes so much of this ideological stuff just seem so puny and it just kind of goes away. And it naturally does lead to a more humanistic approach in my experience, even with people who start off as hardcore, like singularitarians, singularitarians, whatever. Great. Well, Okay, now Vicky's what's oh, your question? Thanks, Ken. Hi. So shortly after you started talking, the concept of human nature kind of um, started kind of permeating my thoughts. It's like, where does human nature come into this? And you started talking about allowing um, the, the technology to be smart, or actually um, not just allowing it, but but um, offering the opportunity for the technology to be smart, um, uh, as opposed to you. And and I thought, well, people are basically lazy. I mean, that is, if you believe that human nature is that, you know, people are lazy and will will be passive if it's easier to be passive, then, then you have to wonder whether there's, the resolution to this is something that really motivates people. The ultimate motivator is fear, right? So, so is is the way out of allowing technology to be smart and humans to be lazy and the traps that we get in that you've talked a lot about and engineers to be stupid as opposed to, to smart in terms mm -hmm. of how they design um, to find a way to to articulate the fear that comes of all of this? Is that what ultimately this is all about? Is like do do we um, formulate these kind of fear scenarios um, in order to be able to get people to think about um, ways not to be lazy so that they can have some level of, hmm. I don't know if it's control, but, but yeah. effect on what's going on I mean, around them. The thing is, your question is 18 years too late. And, and let me explain it's what difficult. I mean by that. Um, there was a huge debate uh, just before, so there was a period of time around 20 years ago and earlier, like the decade before that, when there was a sort of a, a lot of activity trying to think about how to make a connected information thing sort of workable for people. And the particular design of the web um, sort of took off because of its simplicity, but there were a whole bunch of other ones in play, including Ted Nelson's who I mentioned before. And the guys who made the Macintosh operating system had a crazy one at a place called Gen General Magic that might have taken off in a slightly different universe. And there were a bunch of other ones. And 
there used to be raging debates. I mentioned um, the world where everybody can um, sort of earn their way, whether, whether there's money or not, they can actually earn their food and their rent by stuff they do with their heart and their mind. That world that Ted Nelson had originally envisioned as the motivation for the internet, and the very first articulation of the thing, uh, aside from Ian Forster's one, which, he'll, which I hope you'll read, um, the, the response that was always, oh, people are lazy, nobody wants to do anything. And so we all sort of held our breath in the early 90s when the web started to take off because all of a sudden here, once again, empirical testing. If this thing's out there, will people actually make websites? Will anything happen? Or is, is this, or do we have like the species that's perfect for television, just wants to sit there and be fed stuff? Will people, and it, it turns, I mean, the answer is like overwhelmingly clear. And it's so clear that all the new business plans are based on leveraging people's free labor, labor because they are, they're so not lazy. I mean, um, Facebook and Google and all these things are just made out of people's free labor, and the only pro the labor isn't the problem; it's, it's that it's free, which is which is kind of screwing up the future. So, I mean, we've had we asked an empirical question, we were worried about the answer, we received an answer that's been confirmed and confirmed and confirmed. So the the worry was very valid at a certain point, but the answers come in, and but, it's no longer a worry. But but they're participating because there's a commerce motive, right? So what, are what? they? Isn't there a commerce motive? I mean, that there's an opportunity for no, no, an economic no, no, no. advantage. No, 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 no. The commerce thing came in afterwards to exploit it. Remember that in the 90s, there was this huge explosion of millions and millions of people doing all this stuff. And there was not only no commerce motive for them, there was no leader, there was no ideology, there was no opportunity for sex, there was no threat, there was no danger. There was no nothing except for the joy of doing it. Just because it was, I mean, it, it was actually one of the few times we have a fundamental empirical result about a new good thing in human nature that we hadn't dared hope for. So, I mean, that's what happened. And then after that, the commerce came in. I would say that was personal reputation, but I'm very skeptical about it. So, I mean, personal <laughs> reputation does have a motive. I mean, it does try to allow other people to see you in a certain way, which then does advance no, if You know, what I would say to that is if only. In fact, I think people succumbed to the sort of temptations of being able to be snarky while anonymous without taking any risk and standing up for what you said. So if only is what I would say to that. I, I mean, I, I, and I, we've gone through all these arguments and my feeling is that I, you know, I'm very capable of being very dark and skeptical, but on the other hand, to be an honest empiricist, once in a while you have to recognize when there's good news or else you're not being honest with yourself. And as uncomfortable as it might make us as snarky intellectuals, there was good news here and it was for real. Okay, this question. There, there was an uh, article in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was about five years ago, My uh -huh. TiVo Thinks I'm Gay. Which oh, is say it again? About my, what? Tivo, my TiVo Thinks I'm Gay. Oh, yes, I know that. I know exactly that, that story. Right. Yes. So it goes exactly to the point about uh, yeah, yeah. preferences and algorithms to determine who right. we are. So there's also uh, a group, a segment of us, I don't know how many we are, maybe you do, that rather than us being, becoming more stupid to make the algorithms look smarter, we're actually becoming smarter. So because I would rather the thing not target me at all, I want to miss target or have myself mistargeted, so I'm kind of out thinking what the algorithm will do, so I'm calling myself a, a woman who's 67 mm. years old and you know, has a $25,000 a year income. Is that, uh, from your perspective, is that an alternative path around this notion? I of have to confess I couldn't understand that, um, but <laughs> I, I think it's just because the echo, so I, I, I understood all the pieces of it, but I can't quite understand your question. Something about a 76-year-old woman and, well, and I'm a median if I, income. If I, choose, <laughs> I choose to represent myself, let's say. I mean, I'd go for it, man. <laughs> <laughs> we can either become dumber, right, is what you said, so algorithms can have... It depends on the woman, smart. really, and on you as well. You know, but... <laughs> I, I clearly miscast myself. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm sure you can make yourself smarter using the technology. I mean, what I, um, one of the things that I really don't like is um, a frame, how do I put this? I talk about bending over backwards to make yourself stupid, to make the machine seem smarter, but I always frame it in terms of you're the one doing it. I don't like, um, I don't like the way it was framed in the Keller piece and some others of like, is Twitter making us stupid or as if the agency is in the machine, because it never is. It's a very important turn of phrase, which I want to be very careful about. Um, and I also, you know, um, I think it is possible to use all these tools well. I think ultimately we have to make it be personal choice and personal decision on our own way of thinking about it or else what are we doing here? We've already lost the game. So uh, certainly I think you can make yourself smarter using the various tools. Um, and uh, I think there are people who do, and I think there are people who use them well. In a way, it sounds like what you're trying to get us to think about is to understand how we're being, allowing ourselves to become stupid. 
Yeah, if you're gonna make your, if you're gonna make yourself into an idiot, at least notice. Know that that's what you you're know, doing. <laughs> like this is sort of Zen and the art of idiocy or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the next book, right? Yeah, that's the next book. Yeah. Where, where else? We have a question here, and then oh, uh, well, let's get this one first, and then we'll yeah, come back to you. Yeah, because he's in. Thanks. Um, this has been really great and provocative. So. Uh, I grew up in Silicon Valley, total product of it. I went to Mountain View High School, um, and uh, it was, I, th I think I developed this sense of social consciousness when I was around 16 or 17, and it went from being, I think, a great place to grow up to this horrible, horrible, horrible place. And um, I left for a while, and then I, I came back a couple of years ago and started doing work there. Um, but uh, I meet these singulitarians or however you said it, um, and they represent, like, to me, the, the worst people at my high school, like the people <laughs> who were, like, just so, so, so into it and passionate, and I love that they're passionate about something, because mm -hmm. it's good to be passionate, but um, they are, like, how, I love that you also mentioned third world health, and, like, maybe you should do something about that. They're so, like, stuck in Silicon Valley and stuck in that engineering mindset, and, like, that is the center of the universe for them, and they're not noticing that the world is like going to hell right now, and that people are starving, and that we have these wars, we might nuke ourselves before the singularity even happens, so like, how do you respond to that issue? Like, how do you help them get their heads out of their own asses? <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> the first thing I want to, you know, um, I do want to point out that my cri criticisms are not only not personal, but just in my personal experience, a lot of um, a lot of my friends in technical culture, maybe not when they're young, maybe not in high school, but eventually do devote themselves to service in that ultimately they recognize that what technology is is a form of service. Being a technologist is to be a provider of a service. Um, that's the fundamental insight that makes you a good engineer. Until you get that, you never are a good engineer. The moment you get it, you can turn into one. And I know tons of people who actually do do work in third world. And by the way, you know, not a bad example is Bill Gates, who's you know um, made more money than any of the others, and uh, is uh, has already given away enough of it that he's no longer the richest guy in the world. I don't think that's ever happened before in history. So, like, there's you know, this is on a personal level. I see kind of a lot of hope actually, and just in the people I know directly in the trade, you know. Um, they're always involved in things like this, and a lot of people are are very involved in like how do we how do we make a new kind of toilet that's also fertilizer to solve a you know this horrible sewage problem in Haiti or something like that. I, I was just talking to somebody about that, and um, a lot a lot of a lot of similar things. I mean, I think um, there is this thing. How do I put this? So if you talk to Ray. Um, and many other people, he'll say, well, you know, all these worries about the third world, whatever, they're going to get solved because sooner or later somebody's going to come up with some amazing energy source and we'll have so much abundance and it'll just flow over there and trickle down. It's very much like trickle-down economics. It's sort of like, don't worry about the poor or the neighborhoods that are in trouble, you know, just like let the rich people loose and then other trickle-down will solve it. And of course, empirically, you know, it's not, it's not something that's really kind of can be shown to work, I, I think is a thing, I think I can say safely. Um, although, of course, that becomes a whole other debate. Many people are convinced they're seeing it in front of their eyes working, even though they're like, what? But anyway, um, uh, the thing is, though, that he, Ray does have a point there that um, our fundamental way of doing things is running on a resource model that's not sustainable, just to say the obvious thing. And there has to be some kind of serious heavy-duty nerd achievement soon on that point, uh, which if we don't do that, um, there'll be just a lot of pain all around and, and uh, it's, it's going to be really bad because we did well enough early on with the Green Revolution and other things to build up a world population and if we can't continue to evolve technologies to sustain it, then there'll be a very horrible outcome and there's definitely a timer and it's a high stakes game and very scary. Um, and, you know, that, that brings up another really interesting point, which is um, there's a sort of a weird... Um, Ten tension about the whole game of improving technology. So, like, if you ask, well, like, all these, um, basically right now, the, the world is divided into zones that have uh, population implosion versus population explosion. And the places with population explosions um, came, came uh, across the mere possibility of having a population explosion more recently than the places that now have a population implosion. And, um, 
there's a there's a there's a kind of a it's a little bit like the the, the 19th century arguments about technology in general like if you had the ability to such, to increase agricultural out, output and public health and all of these things so suddenly it becomes possible to lower infant mortality and you suddenly have this population explosion are you really doing anybody a favor um, of course, for the people on the ground, initially you are, and then later on maybe you create something that you can only deal with if you then come up with even more innovation. But the thing about technology is that at every stage, at every stage from the very, very beginning of technological progress, um, every um, solutions are driven by real needs that, that can't be questioned, that are just moral imperatives in many cases about just like keeping babies from dying, basically, keeping people from starving. We forget how recently things were really, really crappy. That's something Ray is quite correct about in, in, in the movie, that you know, very recently life expectancy was much lower, and there were examples of um, cannibalism out of desperation all over the world in fairly recent historical periods. I mean, like, the past really sucked before technology made it better. That's just true. That's another thing that sometimes a certain kind of intellectual tendency doesn't want to believe that. They want to believe that things used to be better and it was all nice and natural, but it wasn't. It was actually really crappy and horrible and, and, and uh, cr cruel. Um, but the thing is, every single time you take a step towards uh, saving a baby or something, you also set up a system that could come back and bite you unless you invent even more. Every single thing has side effects, and so you're compelled by the very best moral imperatives into a situation in which there's ever more peril and ever more requirement to then invent again and do better and better to undo the side effects of the previous thing. And that's, that's the human technological condition which, um, which continues. And that's part of the sort of crazy drama of being in technology. That would be a great place to end, but I wondered if you would play one of these instruments one more time before we Oh, well, I only brought these two with me. Which, I can, which can one? you reprise? Yeah, the, well, which, which one? I don't know. <laughs> the, this one? All right, the computer one. Okay. It's a can, K-H-A-E-N in English usually. If you want one, don't get the ones on eBay. They don't work. <laughs> go to Laos and buy your own. Yeah, right? get one. You can go, there's a couple of villages in Northeast Thailand where you can get them pretty well. If you don't want to go to Laos, it's easier. Or in Chiang Mai, you can get them.
Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. I should also say that style is entirely not traditional Southeast Asian music, if you had any doubts. Just, yeah, okay, cool. Thank you all for coming today. Um, July 8th, opening night of Bay Area Now. Thanks for all of you that have stuck with us through all these conversations. I hope you found them as uh, exciting and edifying as we have. And uh, look forward to seeing you at the opening of the exhibition and all the uh, performance and films and public programs that happen all through the summer. Thanks. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs>